Oh yes, this is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. Today's show is sponsored by Ringmaster on a mission to launch B2B podcasts that create relationships, generate revenue, and drive growth. Ringmasterlive.com. Bam. Hey, guess what? I hit the record button and we are launching this thing. This rocket is leaving the rocket launch pad, whatever we call it. This, this train has left the station. Casey Jones at the helm. Let's do this. I can't wait to introduce my guest today. He's an absolute hero in the go-to-market space. He is, he is Gandalf. He's, he's every single Lord of the Rings character on an epic quest in the go-to-market space. Well, who is he, Casey? Who, well, let me tell you about him. Let me tell you. He is a go-to-market thought leader, a marketing thought leader, a revenue thought leader. He's all about building these, these growth engines, but not just one-time fix, but perpetual growth engines. He's an extraordinary strategist. I've, I've known him for a bit, and I've, I've watched him grow and his company grow, and I've just been so oh, just in awe watching as he moves from the technical side to growing into more and more of the revenue and the strategy side to the point where now he's a sought-after analyst and, and strategist, an investor, an advisor. He's an author, too. Here the come the spoilers. He's written two books, Balancing the Demand Equation. That is one you have to balance. And latest book is the Chief Growth Officer Handbook. CEO and co-founder of Annuitas, Adam Needles. Welcome, sir. Hey there, Casey. Good to be on the show. Man, I almost lost myself your introduction. You're just you're a busy guy. You do a million things. You got a family. And I, I should have edited that you for it. you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do it, man. Um, but I'm so excited you're here. So I'm gonna yeah. pass this mic over to you. But let me, it, I have to get this. It's really heavy. One second. <laughs> okay, cool. Take Thor's hammer. Go ahead. Okay. Grab it. I got, I got it. it. I got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah. All I'm right. gonna... Take Thor's hammer. And smash for me some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception. Set the record straight once and for all. I think, and look, I'm I'm biased because obviously I come at this from the go to market side, but I I think the biggest misconception, and I literally have had, <laughs> I was on a call with a, a former Salesforce executive last night. I was on a call with a guy who's a manufacturing executive this morning. All you know, go to market leaders. And I just have the same conversation over and over again, and it's the basis of a lot of work that we do. I'm going to smash the idea that a well-thought-out go-to-market strategy inherently leads to go-to-market success. That you've got the greatest product or service, you know exactly who your target customer is, you know what your value proposition is. You've gone out and done a TAM, like you know your total addressable market. You've got the best set of slides to show a venture capitalist exactly what your business is going to do. And guess what? Go to market falls apart in execution. Like that's oh. the reality, man, right? The best laid plans. Um, we go to market and we just default to random acts. We forget what it is that we we're trying to do, how we we're trying to go after it. And here's the thing that for far too many companies it is truly the accumulation of these random acts that is their go to market program, right? Marketing, sales, customer success programs, demand activities, all just operating in solos, you know, and, and, and this is the, you know, this is the mistake that the ABM movement has, has, has pushed, which is instead of like having a continuous orchestrated motion or orchestrating engagement with you know, your key stakeholder segments, you're driving lift on a continuous basis and you're tuning that engine. You know, the ABM movement has been about more random acts. Like let's have a salesperson and the couple accounts they want to go after dictate all of the go to market programs and you just get more random acts. So I'm smashing that the best laid plans of go to market, best laid strategies, that that is what success is. Like what the way you succeed and go to market is what you do on the ground, how you operationalize your go to market around your customer. Boom. How's that? Man, dude, you're, you are dropping so much fire on us right at the very beginning. One of the things <laughs> I wrote down, which is just like, this goes on, this goes on the poster. 
accumulation of random acts is the program for a lot of people. Right. So how they execute is these, these random, you know, they did all that work. They did all that heavy lifting up front and they, they did what everyone would be happy about. Like you mentioned the TAM and maybe they've got, yeah. they got different tiers and oh, we've got our tier ones and our, we've sorted everyone into appropriate areas and we, we know who we want to go after. And then all that work. And now we're just going to randomly go after, we're going to randomly here's, pursue people. Yeah. Here's, here's, here's how, here's how this goes down. So they, they, uh, let yeah. me talk about personas. Um, no question. Personas are so critical to success, right? But the, let's talk about the persona problem, right? The persona problem is that people do personas on how the customer interacts with their product or service and the key customers that they engage with through the product and service. Go sell something. You engage with a whole bunch of people that are never going to use the product or service and some of the most influential budget holders and deal approvers um, are actually not going to be the target. And so where, where's that in the persona? And so what happens is you have the CX mindset where you want to define value propositions and personas with respect to the product or service. That's critical. I'm not at all saying you shouldn't do that. Hell yeah. But you need to also think about the DX, the demand experience, right? Which is the core of go to market. And DX says, hey, let's go understand all of the stakeholders involved in the commercial decision. In particular, let's go out and talk to people who, as I said earlier, are going to have budgetary, budgetary authority, who are going to oversee things, who aren't going to use it. Let's also go out and understand like that savvy buying you know group that you're going to engage it's not gonna be one person maybe four five six let's go figure out how they're going to work together here's the thing what channels and content pieces and modes of interaction do they need to move the ball right right and so the thing is like what product-based persona has any of those insights none right like so you need to think about you need to think about personas, not only in a CX context, but in a DX. And you need to think about that commercial motion because if we're going to, if we're going to optimize the critical path, we need to understand those elements. So we need to understand the people involved, their motivations, the content channels for interaction. And then we also need to understand the inherent frictions between what you're doing today and what those people expect. That's how you optimize go to market. That's how you optimize DX, right? And so when we talk about like how all this is falling down, it's that we've thought about the product or service, but we haven't thought about how it actually gets sold. Right. Like how, how we're in, and, and I, and I totally get the idea that there are going to be gotchas at, even in the planning stages so that we're not, we're not saying that that's easy that is a hard part but it sounds like people are so fixated on not getting that wrong then when it comes time to execute to actually create the content to actually you know create motions that address the demand experience yeah oh, talk to me about the random acts so here's a here's in fact happen. here's something i want here's something else i want to blow up here so yeah product marketing should not be in charge of go to market Product marketing should be an interface between a product organization. Product marketing should actually sit in product. Product marketing should be an interface to the growth team, which should be sales, marketing, customer success, working together under a chief growth officer, a chief revenue officer. Um, but product marketing and the number of product marketing people who literally like go on LinkedIn, look at their resumes, define their job in terms of, I lead go to market for X product totally disagree that's that product marketer should be the one who is optimizing cx not right. dx okay and and there there's this there's this model of cx and dx and the c is the customer experience yeah. right right now which one comes first which one's the chicken which one's the egg um dx is always going to come first and that's why it's okay. so important the thing is that at the outer so the outer edge of CX is that first trial or demo, right? That somebody has mm. like the first time, you know, it's like, it's like whenever you're walking past the hotel, you haven't even gone in yeah. the building yet. Like that's a CX thing, right? Mm -hmm. 
DX is the outer edge of what was the pain point or need that caused you to like even go down the path, right? Take so the meeting in the first place. Yeah. yeah. DX yeah. was when you were sitting on your couch two weeks ago and were like, I want to take a trip. That was DX, not CX. Right. 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 So pain and we're, points. And we get fixated on the customer side. Are the edge of DX, right? Brand experience, you know, first touch you know, first interaction with the doorman, that's the edge of CX. Mm. Very fluid model. Can you, can you list off some of the classic, cause I want, I want to, I want to address yeah. the random acts before we get to like chief growth officer and some of these other really cool things you've, you've shared. What are some of the random acts you see out there? What, yeah. tell me about how it gets ed executed poorly. Yeah. Go to market. We see uh, more cold calls, you know, still. I mean, here's the thing is that another thing I want to just blow up, like sales law folks, like we, we, we go out and we dump a lot of money into these sales cadence engines and we're just spamming, you know? And so whether it's an email or an overt call, it's all cold calling, right? So right. Hiring a bunch of sellers and just turning them loose, cold calling and giving demos, like we see that, right? Um, another and one then, is and then doing it in the name of go to market, right? Right, like trying right. to give it a different, different oh, food totally, coloring. Totally. I mean, really, come on. It's the like same you know, thing. I know Kyle Porter's not there any any longer, but they've been trying to class up like what Sales Loft does for years. It's an e email spam engine for sellers. Um, <laughs> Shots they fired. They, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wrote about this, so you can go to my blog. I, I have a piece that I wrote uh, in the middle of the pandemic because that's whenever it really got bad, and uh, uh, they haven't talked to me since. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, good, well, good. Um, and they're not but, listening to this but, podcast either. Exactly, <laughs> but so okay, so so number one, more cold calls, more trial offers. Two, more leads, any leads. Let's just take any name in our database and pass it off as a lead. Like, how about that? Um, another one is let's just throw technology at the problem. You know, we had a software company we were working with a number of years ago. And whenever we got in there, I mean, their stack, I mean, looked like Scott Brinker's chart of like the entire <laughs> MarTech landscape. Like they had bought every single sales and marketing technology plugin. <laughs> what they weren't doing is using their marketing automation, their CRM or CMS in any kind of a strategic way. Right. And one of the critical things that our team did was say, hey, if you actually use those systems more, you know, strategically and you actually got them working together, you can actually cancel about two thirds of these software titles that you bought to like, you know, they had like an SEO specific thing and like a ABM specific thing and an ABC thing and an XYZ thing. And they had like all these little problems, but actually yeah. they didn't have a tactical issue. They had a strategic issue, right? But they were accumulating tactical fixes. Um, we actually went through a whole activity and, you know, we're obviously we're doing a transformation engagement with them, but um, we, their CFO loved the first year because we cut their software like they spend on software like in half. Oh man. And I mean, how many times have we seen that where people are just thinking, and I, I mean, I'd done this before I bought a PPC tool thinking it would just make all my problems go away, you know, right. and it, it was pretty and it had cool colors and graphics and UI to it, but it's not going to, you know, it might tell me that my ad's terrible, but it's not going to tell me exactly why my ads, it was just, I was just trying to put a band aid over it, but I right. love the image of people thinking that Scott Brinker's roadmap of the 5,000 million, uh, shout out to Scott. Oh, it's like, it's not a collector's checklist, right? You shouldn't right. be trying to get all of them. And to your point, maybe you only need one, two or three. I mean, what could you do with one of them? Right. As opposed gotta, to trying to get all of them, at, not using them. I mean, this is the key thing. Like you've got to think about a holistic go to market stack. Like that's, yeah. that's, that's, you, you get, to, we get to stop thinking about any one system or plugin is the solution yeah. we need to look at and say like, what is our go-to-market process we're trying to enable? And that should be underpinned by a customer journey lens, right? And yeah. so you want to take that and then say, what is the combination of go-to-market technologies 
that are going to enable you to support that. And that's your stack and that's your integration. And it's not one, it's the group like CMS, CRM, market automation should be working together. So random acts, I, I've got, we're doing more calls in the name of GTM. Uh, we're, we're trying to get more leads, any leads. Tell me more about yeah. that one. What, what, the more well, leads, any leads. Expressed? I mean, so here's an example, um, a security company publicly traded that we worked with for a number of years. Um, when we first engaged His name with them, rhymes with something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Berserks. Berserks. Um, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> we first started engaging with them. Um, they're smart guys. Like they know a lot about their subject. Yeah, they had great I content. Bet. People went to their website. They downloaded their reports. They had a lot of inbound, actually. They were really good at inbound. Uh, okay. But they were really bad at taking those contacts and passing them to sellers. And as a result, the sales team didn't actually... There was a really sophisticated DGR team there at the time, about 40, 50 people. And um, they were doing the lion's share of go-to-market in the beginning. Uh, and they just didn't consider that marketing was contributing any leads, like all, all of the volume of leads at like 62% of contacts that hit their website became a lead. That's about six times what we would recommend. Like we think about one in 10 is where you should be. Um, and, so it was, and specifically it was, why, why is that, was that too much? What, what's going on there when, um, it, what, it's not that it was too, it wasn't the volume. It was that they didn't know anything about these people. They, so, um, first of all, I think the idea of a lead is problematic, right? This idea of a linear lead pass engine, I think is really dying, but lead yeah. telemetry is important. Like you want to know three things about. Um, someone before you engage with them. One, that they've had s sustained engagement with your organization. Like they like your content, they like your POV. Like that way you don't have to convince them of that. Like they're already down with you guys, right? Two, right. you want to know that demographically, firmographically, they're, they're the right fit. Like they've got the right title, they're the right organization. Um, you know, that's, that's an important piece, right? Three, you want to know that they're in a later stage of their buying process, that it is the right time to be having engagement, right? So somebody who's passed along to a seller, call that a lead, needs those levels of telemetry, right? And so when you simply take a download and then pass a contact down, you don't have any of that telemetry. And so when I say typically like one in 10 is what you should see passed, it's not because you want to throttle the volume. It's because you want to know that you've had enough insight and interaction telemetry with those people before they engage with the seller. Right. Okay. So no more random acts. And this is not random acts of kindness, to be clear. This is random acts of go-to-market execution. Exactly. So if, if it's not That's, random Which is inherently acts, unkind to everybody. Which is which is unkind to, to everyone. I mean, nobody wants to say this, but the dirty little secret is most demand marketing programs are NPV negative, right? So for anybody who what? forgets any of the, uh, anybody who forgets that the, the corporate finance or whatever course they took at some point, or they never took that course, right? Um, the, there's a lot of different ways to look at quote ROI, right. um, classical, like, you know, Wharton economists are going to say that net present value NPV, which is, by the way, also in part how Wall Street does valuations. NPV is a holistic look at everything you're doing, all the inputs, all the, the outputs and the stream of cash flows, right? When you do NPV analysis, you get to a complete view of whether or not something is ROI positive or negative, like the investments that you're making. And when you do an NPV analysis of most demand marketing, it is negative. And it is because you're spending most of your time, wrong place, wrong time. Right. Right. It was, which is like what other profession why we cycle through would, senior marketers so quickly. Absolutely. What, what other profession would be paid to get it wrong most of the time? Right. Right. You know, like, yeah. let's say you want to get knee surgery. Do you want to know that, that that surgeon gets it right one in a thousand times? You know, it's a crazy point, but right. some testing has to be built in, but it doesn't, not to the detriment of the entire program, you know? Well, and, and so, so there's two, two 
there's two or three reasons for this. One is the random acts. Two is the disconnectedness of the go-to-market elements, right? And this is the problem of the CMO. Like no organization needs a CMO. Please, I'm sure okay. I'm going to get nasty calls. Wait, wait, right? say like, this again so we can clip this and that, put it right? all over social. No organization needs a CMO. I'm just going to go out there and say that. And I've worked with a lot of great CMOs. No organization needs a CMO. What every organization needs is its marketing pieces fully integrated into the proper elements of the organization, right? So the demand elements pre and post sales should be part of a growth organization. The product marketing element should be part of a product organization. The brand and communications and corporate piece should be part of a corporate communication function. Like you should have a chief comms officer, not a CMO, right? And the chief comms officer is not doing what a CMO is doing, right? Like they're taking the public facing of the company. We need to rationalize. Like we put all of these, you know, talking about like a um, house of cards, we put all these marketing marketing functions into a CMO and it's the wrong alignment because what is their objective, right? Well, most CMOs mm. objective is just to, you know, not get fired in two years. So, <laughs> you know, what? We we want to honest uh, truth here on the hardcore marketing show. Right? Exactly, we're we are hardcore here. So that's it. Uh, not pulling any punches, uh, and I do have Thor's hammer. So that you that's know, that's right. Smash away, right? Um, so the the anyway back to the, the the CMO, you know, is is at top of this house of cards. What you really need is you need be, best in class product, best in class go to market org, best in class you know comms corporate identity, and like those are. Those are the functions and the product org should be focused on CX. The go to market yep. org should be focused on DX. The comms <laughs> organization should be focused on brand equity, brand identity, right? Like brand X, let's go. Brand X, there you go. So, so there are very clear, they're very clear like objectives when we talk about that, but that makes everybody uncomfortable because now sellers and marketers and customer success are working together around a customer journey reporting to a CRO or a chief growth officer. Okay, we've just That's now cool, shattered man. a bunch of stuff. So so the thing is, is that the CRO, the CGO should be leading go-to-market and the CMO doesn't have a role in that anymore. It doesn't make sense. The CMO is an antiquated, you know, concept and it's time that we retired it at this point. All right, say that again for people listening. <laughs> the, the CMO, the CMO is an antiquated concept because it is a role with no mission, and that's what should be right. love, It is man. a, it is a yeah. functional. So just think about this, right? The part, the core of what we're talking about is org design. The issue is org design. Functional org design causes orgs to be misorganized. Functional org design is when you have a chart that's like, hey, this person reports to this person, right? The goal of a CMO is to have all, mar all quote, marketers report to a head of marketing, right? Right. That is an organizational structure that has no rationalization. You have to tip all of that on its side. You got to tip your sales org on its side, all these so other- It's not mission driven, right? It's literally right. just- The mission is the customer driven. journey. The mission is the go-to-market process. So you've got to tip that org on its side and you've got to actually say who has stewardship at each stage of the customer journey. What role are they playing in that, right? And you need to rationalize the different growth ops, rev ops roles, the digital marketing roles, the content marketing roles, the customer marketing roles, the uh, field, the lead development, the, you know, uh, all these different elements need to be rationalized to the role they play in the journey, right? When you tip it on its side, you go, hey, there's a discrete pre-sale and post-sale growth motion. Why don't you have that be an, a converged growth organization, an integrated team with a leader? Maybe you have a pre-sale growth leader, a post-sale growth leader. Maybe you have one CGO that sits over the entire customer journey. But why should you have a separate head of sales or a separate head of marketing or a separate set of, you know, a head of customer service 
strictly because your functional org design lack of brain cells says that they should all report to someone with the same title. Right. That's yeah. the mistake. And this reminds me, and this is great. So I had a chance to go to your, your GTM event, your go-to-market event. Really cool. Uh, some great thought leadership happening there. Sometimes you go to these events the and road, you get the road. I, I, I love the feedback. The road show is getting such great feedback. Yeah. 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 It, because we, we actually talked about what we need to talk about. And so one of the things that got raised on that, and I think the room felt safe, just smashing myths like we're doing here, which was, Hey, we're supposed to be integrated, right? It, for, it's almost like first marketing got their seat at the table. Now we have a CMO, right. but now we're going, yeah, but what do we do? We don't really have a mission. So now we keep getting fired and let go because what do we even accomplish here other than managing the team, like you're saying? But th right. in that room, we were talking about how silly it is and sounds to have a RevOps team, but then to still have a sales ops team and then a marketing ops team. What are we even doing? Right. Are, you know, if, if we have all these separate teams, we're not, re we're, it's almost like we said in the beginning, morally, you know, we're doing random things in the name of GTM. Oh, we have all these RevOps people, but we're still doing what we're always doing. So the idea of combining all this now, I think we're ready for it, is combining yeah. the marketing roles and the sales roles and everything is converging into that one growth role. It's amazing. Yeah, I think it is the time. I mean, here's the thing is that pe people have wanted to do this for a while. The emergence of the title of CRO and RevOps, um, the emergence of those two titles is, it comes from a good place. But the problem is that most CROs are just heads of sales who somebody sticks. That's what I was going to bring up next, right? Do right. you lose some, marketing in that? Do you, does it, do some, we go, are some, we going back and not But here's, what, here's the way this gets executed, right? They name a CRO and they take the CMO and instead of that CMO reporting to CEO, now he or she reports to the CRO. By the way, at that moment, that CRO or CMO is super pissed off. Because now they're not a C-suite executive; they're a sub-level exec, right. a, a, you know, executive. But the CRO still acts like a salesperson and just lets marketing do their thing. So that CRO in most organizations is just a glorified sales leader. And the same thing is the case with RevOps. Like I would love to say that RevOps is a holistic function. I think in terms of growth ops, like I think in terms of like end-to-end. -end Okay. Process systems telemetry, right? So that we have customer data, customer value chain end to end. I think about it that way. The reality is most RevOps people are just sales ops people with a new title. So controversial thought around this is the CRO, and we know how it is now, but should the CRO be a marketer or a salesperson from their, from their path? Well, I, I think that we need to sunset the concept of the CRO because I think it's failed. Um, I think you need a CGO. Uh, a CGO. Yeah, right, Chief right, right. Growth Officer. There you go. There it is. <laughs> um, I think you need a CGO. And uh, I think that that CGO starts to look a lot like general management. So I don't think it has to be a seller or a marketer or a customer success person. But, you know, we, in the book, first of all, I want to be clear. I'm not saying every single organization has to have a chief growth officer. That is not at all my point of view. My point of view is that every organization needs to have an integrated view of their growth organization. They need to be working together. And you need a leader who drives that integration. So when we talk about a chief growth officer, we really mean a leader of an integrated growth organization, whatever you want to call that person. Um, but whenever we were doing the the... The work, and I'm actually just trying to pull up. Um, we actually put together in the book. Um, you guys can all go online and get this book right now. We we have made this available the marketplace um, free for now. Um, we'd also be happy to send you a hard copy of it. So you cool. know, a um, lot of and we'll lot put of a link in the show notes. So if you're interested in getting yeah. this, uh, it's the Chief Growth Officer Handbook. We'll put that yes, sir. link yes, in the sir. show notes. So in in the in the um, position overview that we did in here, right? So we actually talk about like what are the what are the things that somebody needs to bring to the table. Um, we we think that a successful CGO has two out of the three at some point. So they've been a marketer and a seller, or they've been customer success and sales. They've been customer success and marketing. So I don't think any of them should 
come from any one of those per se, but I do believe that they've had exposure and have worked in multiple of those. It doesn't have to be all of them so that they can think across. I think that that starts to look a lot like a rotational, like if you have a growth organization, really the people that are the lieutenants of that, not the captain, the, the lieutenants, they should be people who have like rotational responsibilities. And then they're like frontline analysts, insight people, and they're working their way towards becoming, um, you know, the chief growth officer at some point. Got it. So yeah. much more of a manager. And I, I, I actually wrote down when you said that much more of a manager with a mission because they have a mission right. for growth. They have a mission for the DX side, as opposed to in the past, they were just managing people. So this, this is a fun, right. this is a role, I guess it's functional that, but it has a mission to go out and grow. Um, right. And this person needs a big picture view because one of the things I was thinking about is oftentimes sales can get so fixated on the quarter in the right now, and we need them to because we need to close this quarter out, you know, and do that. Totally. And then marketing can be so big picture, you know, map out the quarters in advance, which can, we also need. But sometimes when we come together, we're too fixated on one versus the other. And, and it, to your point, this integrated role needs to be able to understand the importance of the moment as you know in the context of the bigger picture right right exactly exactly that's it and that's why i said you know it starts to look a lot more like a general management type of a role right. but in order for it to be successful you've got to have an operating system and so this is why we wrote the book and this is why we do the work that we do which is how can you you know drive your go-to-market execution in an integrated way, right? Ultimately, go-to-market should have two objectives, orchestrating customer engagement and driving lift. That's it, right? Those are the objectives, orchestrating customer engagement and driving lift. And by the way, it's a function, right? So driving lift is a function of orchestrating customer engagement. Um, and that, what we call a converged growth, go-to-market organization, should unify all your people, process, content, technology, data, and should help take these tactical interactions and silos and start to bring them together where it's a continuous motion. For us, we're trying to help, or, and you said this in the beginning, we're trying to help organizations get to a point where their go-to-market is a growth engine, where it is a continuous in and out, where they're optimizing, where there's clear stewardship, clear roles for everyone, um, and every organization can get there and be there, right? It's just a, a matter of your reticence to like, hey, are you going to operate in silos? Are you going to not work together? Are you going to do random acts? Are you going to say, hey, the motion? Because why should we have the efficiency? Like, <clears throat> you know, Henry Ford with the assembly line as approach to manufacturing, yeah. you know, many, many years ago helped us go like, hey, if we have a more efficient way to create something, right? You know, it's better. You can get out to more people, drive the cost down, et cetera. Well, why shouldn't our go-to-market be better, drive the cost down, and get to more people? Yeah. Isn't that the point? Why do That's we treat go-to-market like it's the wild, wild west? I, I have been at this, and it is uh, just, we just celebrated 10 years this year. Jeez, congrats. Um, I've been involved with, uh, and the org's been involved with over 100 enterprise transformations over that period of time. And prior to that, I was a CMO. I was also an evangelist um, for uh, Silver Pop before they got acquired by IBM for their B2B marketing and market automation segment. Um, and so I've been on the front lines and my view is that nothing has changed in that we still have the same problem, which is we still have Wild Wild West go to market operations. And in fact, all of the technologies, including AI, including ABM, have actually made it worse and has balkanized and it's just weaponized everybody to not work together and instead to like be, you know, every single member of the go-to-market team is actually about themselves and their own objectives and their own, you know, annual review. And they weaponize technology in that way. Like the technology should be much like in manufacturing and ERP should be part of an end-to-end -end process where it's all working together, you know, um, that's the only way that we're going to actually get the uh, ability to really tune the engine uh, over time. Man, Adam, I feel like this this combo is a masterclass, but I feel like it's you know, 
it's episode one of 50 that we could have <laughs> around this topic. You know, it's like asking Elon Musk how to build a rocket. There's just so much to it. But my next question is a little different because I'm just curious, like, who are you? Who are you? How do you know all these things? Take me back in time. Little Adam days. Did little Adam know he's going to be writing, you know, at least two books, probably more in the way, running company, teaching and transforming companies. Yeah. Take me back in time. What, did, what was he? What was he looking at? So I, I, um, I think that I think the thread for me that has translated to what we do today is you can't pin me down. Like I'm a very like Renaissance interdisciplinary kind of guy. You know, like I have never been like, oh, I'm gonna like wake up and just be a doctor, or wake up and just be a finance person, wake up and just be a lawyer. You know. Like I always right. bristled at the idea of like being tied into one category growing up. Like I was the guy who like I was doing, you know, a bunch of science stuff. And then I was also doing a lot of outdoor stuff. And I was, you know, big skier, big hiker, big climber, um, you know, but, you know, lo loved, like I said, loved math and science. Also like did, you know, theater and arts and what, you know, like I didn't do one thing. I did all of them because for me. Like, I don't, I don't want to be pinned down. I actually loved the different things that I was engaged with over time. And so growing up, like, that's the way I was. And then I went to, I did my undergrad at Georgetown in the Foreign Service School, which is um, the, their international affairs school, but also they supply a lot of the people that actually go into the Foreign Service and State Department. But what appealed to me about Georgetown, about that program was this um, you know, Je Jesuit education, which is this like, hey, we want you to leave here with like, you know, having been exposed to everything, being well-rounded, like having to take religion courses, like having to take, you know, language courses, having to take econ, having to take, you know, math and science, like you have to do a little bit of everything. And so in the foreign service school, I was in uh, a nascent program at the time. It was run by this guy, one of the coolest guys I've ever met. Uh, uh, and uh, he was the former uh, science advisor to the World Bank. And wow. he ran this program in science and technology and international affairs. And, you know, if you want to know where all of the people that wanted to go start tech ventures or like wanted to like sell, you know, save the environment or health or whatever, and didn't fit neatly into, you know, international banking and finance or national security or like all these other like international affairs disciplines, you know, we were sort of like the misfits, right? And there's like 10 of us a year that were graduating the program. But it's like, that's where I really started to get like interested in the intersection of, you know, in international affairs, global business, um, entrepreneurship, uh, technology, you know, people, culture, and all of that just threaded together to, you know, fast forward, I leave college. I get out in the tech industry working for a, a, a tech PR and marketing agency for the first couple of years, working with Motorola, working with Platinum, um, start an analyst firm, then go become the CMO of another analyst firm, you know, win my way to working for Silverpop, like, you know, work in the tech space for a number of years. And I, I got to Silverpop and I was interacting with companies buying market automation in the heyday of like when it was first coming to the marketplace. And I had this ultimate realization and this all connects together. The technology is not the problem. It's the lack of an operating system, a process. And that process, that way to operate has to be interdisciplinary. And so like, it's just like, this has been my whole life is yeah. thinking in this, like, I'm not about one discipline. I'm about connecting the dots between disciplines because success is when you do that. Man, all the different, you know, all the different subjects in school, all the exposure to different things. Um, so you did theater too? I did, man. I, uh, I honestly, I, uh, <laughs> for a whole bunch of years in high school, uh, I was the uh, lighting designer for like every single show, you know, musical wow. theater, concerts, you know, straight theater. Um, and, you know, I loved about that again. I was using all this technology to like program the shows and like do all this yep. complex stuff, but it was also like art driven and emotion. Um, I'll tell you the funniest thing. I've, I've done a whole bunch of shows over the years. Um, but, uh, 
my senior year, the, uh, the fall play was Neil Simon's Brighton Beach Memoirs. And there's so much nuance and changing emotion and things going on. And I was like, lighting needs to literally be such a critical part of every single scene and it needs to be changing constantly. And so uh, this was also right whenever computerized lighting interfaces were starting to come into the market. Okay. And so the director of the show thought I was crazy, but like I literally um, like not only had a computerized like board running that show, but I programmed more cues for that show than any musical I'd ever done. And it was because like this one show with its tiny cast and its set was so complex and there was so much going on and I needed to be constantly adjusting mood and time of day and perspective wow. and angle and focus. Um, but I love, I love that. I mean, honestly, my, uh, you know, everybody always talks about like the secret careers that you never went down. My, <laughs> yeah. my, my top three secret careers are, um, lighting designer, um, having a morning drive radio show, um, and being a ski patroller. And see, oh, Casey, man. that's why I get along with you because you definitely bump up like two and a half of those three there. <laughs> you know, you know, throw me on the theater stage. I also love directing too. It's interesting. Um, directing, I was in specifically comedy because I, I, I could almost like with marionettes, I, I could put my humor into the actors there. You know, they were doing their thing, but I would say, hey, why don't you try this a little bit differently? And then that was really funny, right? So I, I could make, it wasn't just me being funny. Now it was everyone was funny. Um, and I love that side of directing. But that's really cool. You know, even the idea of the, what are your secret careers? You know, your secret uh, jobs. Lighting designer. Uh, morning radio show host. I feel like there's a podcast in your future. And then Ski Patrol. Totally. We're going to totally. have to figure that out. We have to I, 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 for years in the Boston area, the like, I mean, literally, probably the greatest morning radio person I, I know everybody knows howard stern but mm -hmm. it's 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 matt siegel who is maddie in the morning show and kiss one in the morning and it was because this guy um you think he's just a dumb jock like you just think you like you think you think that he's just a guy who's like you know doing little bits between music in the morning but not at all this guy is literally one of the most intellectual thoughtful like interviewers I've ever heard. And he has interviewed some really famous people over the years, wow. both in studio, remotely. Um, he would just switch it on and switch it off. He'd be goofy one minute. His crew would be like having ridiculous antics. And then he'd like have some like, you know, it's like interviewing Matt Damon and like having this really thoughtful conversation. And, you know, the all these people that would like do interviews with him, like, like if you came to Boston and you interviewed with like, you know, five television or radio shows, like he, he would be one of them. Right. Yeah. Um, and it speaks to like, I don't remember how long the guy was on the air, but it was like 20 or 30 years, like some ridiculous amount of time. So, uh, I've never met Matt, uh, but listened to his show for a lot of years, but also thought like, I mean, what a great career and think about all the people that he's impacted, uh, stuck in Boston traffic for hours on oh end over the gosh, years. Man. Right, and you need it because Boston traffic is the worst. Totally, man. It's so bad, soul sucking. Yeah, shout out to Matt Siegel. Yeah, having an impact off the radio. Yeah. It's something about voice and something about having a captive audience, whether they're on a run, or shout out those listening to this show on a run, or maybe you're mowing the the lawn, or eventually you might be snow blowing, depending on what season you're in, or what God's part of willing the country. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah. really what I'm looking at. You know, look, we've, we've had a great, great summer, great fall. We had the book come out. We've been doing our road show. We're next in Raleigh, Durham on November 15th. Okay. And so I'm super, super excited about all of that, but, uh, I'm also super excited about ski season. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> me too, man. fast me enough. <laughs> Before I let you go, I have a hypothetical question for you. Go for it. See, I may or may not have a time machine up here in New Hampshire, right? Okay. So Next time you're in the area. If there's any come, state that has a time machine, I believe it's New Hampshire. New Hampshire's the place, man. So you come is, hang man. out in New Hampshire. We get some die. beer, some lobster. That's right. And it's in the backyard covered in a tarp. So we, we go out there. We use the time machine. It's a particular kind of time machine. 
you get to go visit yourself. You get to see yourself a couple days after getting that undergrad degree. Yeah. And you get to give yourself any kind of advice or chat or tell yourself anything you want to tell yourself. What would you say? Um, the one thing I would say is that, and I'm sure you get this from just talking to me for five minutes. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a driver. I'm always driving myself. I'm always trying to like accomplish as much as I can each day. And I do think that the one thing I would tell my myself, you know, if I go back in time is to take breaks in your personal and professional life. I think that we make this mistake where we talk about work-life balance. And I think that if you're cranking it for a couple of weeks on some work thing and you have a great outcome, then good for you. Or if you take a bunch of time for a professional or for a personal thing from your professional, like good for you. Like there, there's no, there's no perfect balance. There's no like nine to five, like world, like that's kind of not real. But I do think that what's real is that you should hard charge in your career and phases but you need to take breaks. And for me, I feel like, um, you know, I was, I mean, actually back to skiing for half a second. Like I wish between high school and college, I'd taken a year off and just went and like worked at a ski area, you know, cause I was always yeah. going to go back to college, but wish yeah. I had taken that year off. I wish that I had, um, taken more breaks between jobs, starting companies over the years. Um, we just don't do enough of that. And I think, you know, taking breaks, working hard, accomplishing things, sometimes failing, which is good. Um, you should take a break between those moments, you know, a rest step. Um, you, I feel like this is a trite, but like if you're climbing a really tall mountain, you got to take rest steps. You can't just charge all the way up. I mean, speaking my language, the rest step, not everyone knows <laughs> what that is. Rest step is, uh, is where you use your bone structure to rest. So you're not always constantly working those muscles. Um, that's a really great analogy, man. Where can people reach out to you? They want to connect. They want to learn about you. They want to get the chief growth officer handbook. They yeah. want to sign up for the next event. Where do you want them to go? If you Google annuitist chief growth officers handbook, um, you know, I don't, I will be somewhere in the top one, two, three results, you know, just depending on paid and organic or whatnot, but, um, we'll be up near there. You'll see how you can download it. Um, there's definitely a blog post on our, on our site about it and you can follow the links to that. So. If you just Google it, you will find links to be able to download it. Um, if you want to connect, those listening, we'll, we'll do that work for you and add, yeah. we'll get the link and then we'll put it in the notes. So people just click right through. I love that. I love that. You can even use some GTM um, tracking if you want. It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but, uh, you know, annuitist.com, you know, or LinkedIn. Um, I actually do respond to anybody who just reaches out. So reach yeah. out to me. Let's catch up. Heck yeah, man. Dude, this has been so good. Adam, thank you for coming on here. I've really enjoyed our time over the last bit. Thank you for that invite to the event. If you're in the rally area, you should definitely get to that event. Next time there's a roadshow in your area, definitely attend. This is actually worth your time to go to. Adam, thank you, man, for coming on here. Thanks, Casey. We really appreciate it, man. This has been a, uh, I feel like this is cathartic to like take all the points of the view in the world and just like put them all out there and, uh, you know, catch up for a few minutes. Yeah, drop the gauntlet on the CMO role for sure. I can't wait to clip the hell out of that. <laughs> for those listening, if you learned something, and I freaking know you did because I literally have two pages of notes over here, front and back, <laughs> I've run out of them in the margins and everything, then share this with someone else. One person sharing good info with one person needs to hear it. That's thought leadership. But don't stop there. Three people, 9,000 people, whatever. But get this information out there. You know, post a link on LinkedIn comment what did you get from this what was your takeaway what was that key takeaway tag adam tag myself we'll hop in there we'll have a little comment fun and we'll chat about this thing we'll have a dialogue let's see how we can make these roles not about managing people but about getting things done with that you are the man adam thank you again for coming on here no you're the man casey i appreciate it all right everyone this is it this is another great episode of the hardcore marketing show we will see you all next time